Okay, welcome back. Uh, we're uh, in this lecture. We're going to talk about chapter six, where chapter six is mostly a continuation of chapter five, and the main difference here is that we're going to make the problems a little more realistic. And actually, that's kind of a theme for the class. We're going to start with the simple examples. We're going to start with the simplest formulas. And then we're going to say, you know what? Those aren't as realistic as we really need to, to talk about actual real world finance problems. Uh, and so then we'll go on and we'll introduce some complications. We'll make the problems a little more realistic. And the main way we make the time value of money problems more realistic is by adding what we call intermediate cash flows. And that means cash flows that occur in between the present value and the future value. Okay. So uh, multiple cash flows are more realistic for a lot of reasons. For instance, we worked some problems in chapter five where we talked about some like buying something on a credit card, but not paying it off, any of it off for six years. Of course, that's not realistic because credit cards require that you make a minimum monthly payment. And if you're smart, and good with your money, you'll make sure that you're paying more than your minimum monthly payment to try and pay your credit card off quickly. Or for instance, we had a problem where you paid your whole house off all at once. Again, completely unrealistic. You make a monthly mortgage payment. And nobody saves for retirement by getting $180,000 and plugging it in the bank and then waiting 40 years. Hopefully you save for retirement by putting a little bit of every check that you ever get into a retirement account and hoping that it slowly over time builds up into enough to retire. Okay? So that's how we're going to make these problems more realistic. We're going to introduce the idea of the payment. And calculator wise, this is absolutely no different than what we've been doing. We're just going to have a payment on the calculator. Uh, math wise, if we look at the formulas, they, they are a little more complicated. But again, I don't expect anybody to be using the, the formulas. You've got uh, any number of calculators, graphing calculator, and the financial calculator both handle these with ease uh, and including the payment is just a, a matter of thinking more, a little more deeply about the problem and how the inputs interact with each other. Okay. So we're gonna start by uh, looking at some examples. Uh, now what characterizes these examples in a big way is uh, first again, I'm gonna show you uh, how to think about these problems by working them by hand. In other words, how to think about a problem with intermediate payments if we, if we didn't already know that there was a calculator or a formula to help us out. So if we just use the things that we know from chapter five, can we work out a problem that has intermediate payments? And the answer is yes. And there's two different ways to do it and I'm gonna show you both of them. I won't test you on them now, but I do wanna emphasize that this isn't the only time you're gonna see this strategy. So the reason I want to show you this strategy is because it does have a use, okay? The formulas here for payments uh, for these more complicated time value money problems, they are only true with a certain set of assumptions. And I'll talk about the assumptions when we work the problem. But if those assumptions aren't true, then we have to use this long strategy that we're going to work right here uh, in order to solve the problem. And so that means we're going to see this again when we come up to chapter 10 and we're talking about valuing companies, okay? So... So pay attention here, don't just blow through this first example, even though I told you you can use a calculator. This is just me trying to demonstrate uh, initially uh, some stuff that's gonna come up later on. Okay, so we'll work a couple of examples here. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll work some examples by hand. Then of course I'll show you how to do it with the calculator. We'll work another problem here where I show you what, how to do it with the calculator um, and, and then come back to me, okay? Okay, welcome back. I, I hope you went and worked those problems. Uh, again, I really think that particularly in these two chapters, you cannot work enough examples of these problems because they're going to be so relevant and so important going forward. So please just jump back and forth from the videos, work the different problems, then come back to the lecture. We'll talk a little bit more and we're going to work more problems. Most of chapter five and six, you've already seen chapter five. And again, most of chapter six is going to be example videos. Okay. So we talked about in that last example, we talked a lot about compounding period and how important it is. And hopefully, of course, this isn't the first time we've talked about compounding period. We talked about compound and simple interest back in chapter five, but I want to reinforce how, uh, just how important compounding period is and talk about the most common compounding periods that we're gonna see, uh, both in practice and in this class. So certainly the most common one is annual, meaning the interest is compounded once a year. That's the most common example we're gonna do. It's probably the most common contract that you would see 
Um, but that's not to say that there aren't other ones. Certainly monthly is probably the most common personal compounding instance. If you are paying a credit card, you're paying it off monthly. If you have a bank loan for a car or for a house, that interest is being compounded monthly. If you are contributing to your retirement account, you are probably doing so monthly. Okay. So again, monthly is a very common compounding period. And, and we saw in our last example, uh, how to adjust our compounding periods. We're gonna talk about why those adjustments need to be made. Again, it's not just because I wanna make your life hard. Uh, there is a specific reason why we are typically given an annual rate, and then we have to adjust everything else to be uh, to, to the appropriate compounding period. And we'll talk about that in just the next slide. Uh, some other compounding periods that we'll see pretty commonly are daily. Uh, in fact, I, I used monthly as your credit card payment, but credit card interest is very often uh, compounded daily. So they're gonna charge you interest every day, but only ask you to pay the credit card off every month, which is a way for them to get a little bit of extra compounding interest off you because they are compounding on a daily basis. Uh, lots of big, complicated financial uh, structure, uh, structured settlements and stuff like that. Uh, are compounded daily. So if you ever get into the investment world, you'll see a lot more daily compounding. Uh, the, the other big compounding period that we're gonna work with a lot in this class is semi-annual. That means twice a year. And the reason we're gonna do this a lot is because in the bond chapter, which is the one that we're gonna cover next, chapter seven, uh, bonds are corporate loans and bonds are compounded semi-annually. And the interest that they pay to their investors is semi-annual. So corporate bonds are usually semi-annual, government loans, government bonds are usually semi-annual. So we'll deal with that a lot. So these are the most common. Some other less common that we might see are, for instance, quarterly, which means four times a year. Uh, so oftentimes say, for instance, uh, dividends paid by corporations, the share of the profit uh, that's paid to the investors of the, the owners of the company are paid quarterly. Uh, so we talk about some quarterly compounding. The process for adjusting these only relies on the, whether you know how many compounding periods there are in a year, right? So semi-annual, there's two compounding periods a year. That means you're adjusting your rate and you're in by two. Monthly, there's 12. So you're adjusting your rate and you're in by 12. Quarterly, there'd be four. Daily, there'd be either 360 or 365. But again, in this class, just assume it's 365 unless I tell you differently, right? So, uh, we, we worked an example here. Here's the, the um, here in the slide is, the, is again the answer. Uh, again, I try to make sure that uh, for all the questions that we work, all the examples that we work, there are at least, uh, at least the answers in the slides, if not the solutions. But the general truth is that the more periods, the more compounding there is, the higher the future value. And that hopefully by now, hopefully that makes sense that the more opportunity I have to charge interest on interest or to earn interest on interest, the greater the future value is going to be uh, whenever we're done, right? So if I'm compounding monthly, then I should, if I'm earning, let's say I'm investing in my retirement account and I'm getting monthly compounding, then I'm gonna have more money in my account at the end of one year than if I was only getting annual compounding because every month that little bit of interest I earn is also going to earn interest in the following month and the following month, okay? So that compounding, it builds up. And the more periods I have, uh, the more compounding I'm gonna see. So if I have 40 years of months, I'm gonna have considerably more money than if I have 40 years of just annual compounding, okay? Uh, so here's, again, here's a new example. We'll jump to this example. Uh, just illustrating using the calculator to incorporate payments. Uh, and you'll see, of course, you'll see that there's absolutely no difference here. You're just using the payment key. Uh, the main thing that you have to worry about is making sure that you're getting your cash inflow and outflows correctly so that you have the correct sign on your present value, future value, and payment keys. Okay? Other than that, uh, there isn't any like actual thinking difference here. Okay, so So don't get scared by incorporating the payment key. You just have to make sure that you're thinking about your cash inflows and outflows. Okay, so work this example and then come back to me.